Good morning and welcome to Waratah. Everyone's biggest nightmare. I also with not one but two microphones. That's right. I think I have the ability, uh, possibly not necessary to have both. Uh, but my name's Ailsa and uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of all of us at uh, Waratah Church. Welcome to people who are new and visitors to the church. Welcome to the people that come every week. It's great to see you. Today we've got a couple of exciting things. Uh, we have Clinton who's going to be bringing us the sermon today and Clinton has a lot of experience uh, being a guide in, was it South Africa? South Africa. Um, and he's bringing us a sermon today on family, which is really exciting. I still have parts of my mind blown from the last time that Clinton gave us a talk about how trees talk to each other. And we were discussing in the music team earlier that we talk to trees, but it's, it's okay because they don't talk back. Well, not directly. So you're in safe hands this morning. <laughs> um, we're also going to hear a, a Bible reading from Jeff. There's one from Exodus and Colossians and Ephesians. So get yourselves ready. Um, what helped me kind of hone in when I was thinking about our worship this morning, because that tends to be how we start. We have a chat with each other and welcome each other to the service and then we start by singing some songs together. And when I was thinking about worship, I was thinking about when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, which is in John 4, verse 23 and 24. And she clarifies with him, oh, but don't the Jews, like the only type of worship for the Jews is when they are in Jerusalem at the temple. There's only one way to do it, in, in, um, was her question. And Jesus responded to her like this, and this is a message translation. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is looking for out there. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. And I kind of like that idea. Uh, God knows you when you walk into this place and when you're out of this place. God knows you. He knows if it's been a struggle for you to get here this morning. He knows if this really is not your favourite song and you're just going to grit your teeth and get through it all the way to the end. And, and, you know, we all have those thoughts going through our head. And, and I love the idea of God looking at me going, I know you hate this one, Elsa, but you're just going to have to ride it out. God knows if your knees are hurting, if you've been standing up for too long when there's too many songs in a row. But... During these songs this morning, I just want to encourage you to just be you with God your Father. Whether it's a real heartfelt focus on the words or whether it's just a great beat that you're tapping out with your foot or whether it's just the joy of hearing everyone together. Whatever is, is, a, is truth and connection in worship with you and God, I encourage you to join us and, and do it that way this morning. So having said that, uh, let's stand up while I run to the piano and uh, we're going to sing our first two songs together. Oh, I did say run. Oh, yes. <laughs> Three metre sprint is my, uh, is my signature event. Okay. Here we go. Two, three, four. Let's see. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Lift your name on high. 
So if you know me, you might want to sit down because I might take too long. But we're going to do the kids' song next. So if there are any kids who'd like to come out the front, it's an action song, but I have not yet grown extra arms. So I can't play piano and do the actions at the same time. So we might need some clever adults as well. Have we just got just Josh? All right, so you can hang next to Dad or you can hang here. So I want to show you... Good, hang there. You hang right there. 
So we're singing a song called The Blind Man and I'm going to teach you some people that don't speak with their mouths can speak with their hands. So they can say lots and lots of things by talking with their hands and it's called sign. So this is the sign for blind. If you get your hand, you guys can do it too. You get your hand like that and you bring it down. That's the blind. That's blind. So when we sing the song, we go, the blind man sat by the road and he cried. So that's cried. You show me cried. Get your little tippy fingers and you go, cried. Oh, that's good. And you can pull a face like that. That's cried. So we go, the blind man sat by the road and he cried. And then when we get to the chorus bit, this is not like it's not a proper sign, but it's kind of a groovy sign. So the song goes, show me the way. And you can go, show me the way. Like that. Or you can do it without a wiggle if you prefer. Or you could just do a small one if you're one of those people who doesn't really. Or you can really, you know, get right into it depending on what you like. So that's show me the way. And then the way to go home. And that's home. Like that. So you go like that, like you're going up and over a hill with your hand. Can you do that? Show me that. You show me home with your hand. Yeah, that's it, home. So when you're out with mum and dad, and dad is like talking and talking and talking, you can kind of come up behind dad and you can go, home time. Can we go home, dad? Home. But you can do it without saying it out loud so it doesn't sound like whinging. It's just a small amount of pressure. Home, Right, so that, so the first verse is blind. The second verse is cripple. So you get your little pointer fingers like that and point them at the ground. And it's like your hands are walking. So that's cripple, so like a way cripple. The crippled man sat by the road, and you already know cried. He cried. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I also learned, um, oh, and then the, the third verse is we all. Let's not get our arms tangled up, and please don't poke anybody near you in the eyeballs. Touch your shoulders like that. And then bring them out. So that's we, or all, all of us. Use, and use, and use. All right? That's, a, that's an official English word of a teacher, I know, use. So that's we all sat by the road, and you know cried. <laughs> and then Jesus, brand new sign, I had never learnt this one before. Using your middle finger, tap the palm on one of your hands. And then use the middle finger of the other one to tap the other side. That's Jesus. What a cool sign. The um, parts in his palm where um, Jesus was nailed to the cross. So that's Jesus. Good sign. So Jesus stood by the road and he cried. And then the last bit. There's a, there's a complicated clapping routine which I won't bother doing with you because I'm on long service leave and I don't need to teach anything. So, woo! <laughs> Um, but we go, Jesus, ba 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 Or you can just, you know, just randomly do lots of clapping. Now, I'm leaving you with that, and I'm going to go play the piano. So I might just occasionally try and give you a prompt. So sh- how about we do them all, right? So show me blind, the blind man, the crippled man, we all, yeah, and then Jesus... And then, show me the way. (laughs) Head optional. (laughs) And the way to go home. Everyone's going to remember home. You're welcome, husbands. Home. (laughs) Home. All right? Let's go. All right, if you'd like to stand up with us and let's do the blind man. (laughs) I apologise to anyone who's not met me before. I'm always like this. Okay. Here we go. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. We haven't started. We're starting now. Blind. Here we go. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. The blind man sat by the road and he cried.
Okay. <laughs> awesome. And nothing just gives me any more joy than the, the thought of, of Jesus watching us and going, nice one, guys. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit dorky and probably slightly irreverent, but it's all right. I'd be in there with you having a go. Um, Josh, are you happy to collect the offering this morning? Awesome. Is there somebody else who'd like to give Josh a hand to collect the other side? If, if you're new, um, lots of people do electronic giving, so don't feel like if it's passing you, don't feel bad about that. Um, this is just an opportunity if you would like to give, you're very welcome to. And we're going to play uh, one of our newer songs for you called King of Kings. Are they actually, are they actually singing? Are they singing? It's really quick, really soft. Two, three, four. so much. <coughs> Let's pray for the offering. Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come and meet together this morning. And that you know us. When, when, when we knock on the door and come into your house, you go, oh, awesome. It's Graham, he's here. Oh, it's so great to see Val. You, you know us so intimately and I, and I thank you that we are always welcome in your house. I thank you for the sacrifices that people have made to uh, share their offering this morning and I pray for wisdom for the people that are using this, that this money will share your love in this community and in this church and people's lives and that it will make an impact. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Peter up and he's going to do a pastoral prayer for us. He's quite well qualified being <laughs> the pastor. <laughs> Thanks, Elsa. Um, I just want to say that I'm just so heartened and encouraged by just the, um, the, the spirit in which we've been worshipping this morning and even just before the service, just hearing so many conversations and laughter and a bit like what uh, Elsa was talking about in her prayer. It's just beautiful. Um, I want to read you something uh, from the Gospel of Mark that I've been reading um, in my own time and uh, this has just been in my mind. I can't get it out of my head. And uh, anyway, I'll just read you this a little bit. Jesus and his companions, sorry, this is Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, Sunday if you like, he went to the synagogue and began to teach. You know, because you go to church on Sunday, right? The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, 
Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The reason why I said I was just so heartened and encouraged by the spirit by which um, we've been worshipping this morning is what struck me so much that I've never seen in this text before is that the very first miracle in the Gospel of Mark is not just Jesus driving out demons, but he's driving out demons in the synagogue. Let me give you the 21st century version of this. The demons don't have problems with people attending church, but when the real Jesus turns up, all of a sudden it's, why are you interfering with us? And I think that's really important. I've spent a a week at the um, pastoral retreat prior and there's a lot of articles flying around about we've got to get people back to church. Yeah, but the biggest thing is we're going to make it Jesus-focused because that's what's real. And so that's my prayer this morning, and we're going to have a quick prayer um, about that and a few other things. So let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we do not want this to be mere observance of a routine Um, I thank you so much for each and every person here because there are so many other things that people could be doing right now. But Lord, as Elsa led us this morning with that uh, text from John chapter 4, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We do not want to be in mere attendance, but we want to be in your will. We want to be living our lives according to your will. And we come not to tick a box, but to worship the God of the universe because we cannot even still yet wrap our minds around why you would be so gracious to us. And I pray, Lord, it is, it is your house. It is your house. And it's not that you need an invitation from us. But I pray that nonetheless, that you would be welcome here and that you would be welcome in every heart. For you do say that you stand at the door and knock. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth like the woman at the well for some of us it may mean that we have to put our water jug down that we may have to abandon what we're currently doing the moment we discover who you really are just as she did but i just pray that whatever may be holding us back from really welcoming you into our hearts this morning would you please remove it lord I pray that we would not be scared of, of, dare I say it, your interference in our own lives and schedules. But may we be living in your will. I also want to pray particularly for those this morning, because there has been a few during the week, who are either unable to be here, or those, some that are here nonetheless, but are still having a lot of concerns in their family, caring for other family members, often kids and grandkids, due to various circumstances that have happened in their extended families. I want to lift up these carers to you, Lord. Thank you that you have showed us compassion, and I pray, Lord, that your compassion would give those that need extra strength and extra encouragement to show compassion. Lord, I pray that you would refill their tank, as it were, because there is a lot of care happening at the moment for folks within our own families. So, Lord, I just lift up especially the carers, especially those who have been called to show care and compassion at a moment not of their choosing and uh, with, with the emotional with the emotional baggage that comes of it being within their own family. Especially pray for those who show care and compassion but are never shown any appreciation. I pray for them. Lord Jesus, again, we 
Thank you for the privilege it is to come before you, the all-consuming fire, in your house, the Holy of Holies. Thank you for this that we get to participate in this today. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us as we sing Living Hope and Yet Not I, but Through Christ in Me? Two songs that are very full of Jesus' truth, the truth about Jesus' life and what Jesus was doing on earth for us. And I pray that they're an encouragement today for if there are things that are sitting in the dark, that almost the first thing that comes into your mind when you think, oh, it's never going to happen or it's impossible or I can't or she won't. I pray that these songs would, will speak to that this morning about the hope that Jesus gives and the fact that that second song, Yet Not I, that it's not something that we have to achieve by ourselves. Mm.
Good morning. The Bible readings this morning are from six different passages, so we'll get to it. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Ephesians 5, 25. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Psalm 133, verse 1. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. May God bless his word to us. Thanks so much, Jess. We're going to evacuate the stage and hand it over to you, Clinton. Thank you so much. Oh, good morning, folks. You can you all hear me all right? Yeah? Well, I chose those readings this morning, and I went to Professor Google, and I Googled readings on family, and those are some of the readings that came up. Hang on a second. I've lost my notes. So I Googled family. Now I'm putting Google first right now for the simple reason today we often go to Google first before we go to the Lord or go to the Bible. Okay? So the definition of family, a group of one or more parents and their children living together as a unit. What is the true meaning of family? True family definition is the sense of loyalty, selflessness, love and genuine care and concern for others. So go to the, to the real world and find your chosen family. Those who will stand by you no matter what and those who will support you no matter what. That's what Google has to say about family. Now if we ask what Jesus or God says about family, what is God's definition of family? The family is the foundational institution of society ordained by God. It is constituted by marriage and is composed of people related to one another by marriage blood and adopted family. The family is a fundamental institution of human society, and this you will find in Genesis. What does God say about family? Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Why is God's family important? When God created humans, he designed us to live in families. And the Bible ref ref refers to the family relationship or is very important to God. The church, the universal body of Christ, is called the family of God. So we are all the family of God. Okay? Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had a guest speaker here, and he actually spoke about family. And on that particular day, I actually said to Peter, I'm going to talk about family when I come up there this morning. So that gent, that was, I think it was Mark. Yeah, Mark. And he basically just so confirmed family and just confirmed my reason for actually talking out today about family. Now, I made this a nice large print because I can't read without my glasses, but it could have been a bit bigger. <laughs> what is God's order of the family? There are no doubt that the spiritual order of priorities is God. Spouse, children, parents, extended family, brothers and sisters in Christ. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the rest of the world. Now as we're going through on some of the animals I want to talk about this morning, I'll just ask this question to you all. Is your family, sorry, in your family growing up, 
this is as you were a child. Was God the head of your family, or your dad, or your mother? If you have your family today, gents, are you the head of your family and lead the family, or is it your wife? Where is God in your family relationship today? Ladies, are you the head of the family, the leader of the family? Do you take control of the family, or do you allow your husband to be in control of the family? Please remember God should be placed first in family. Okay, what do we got there? Right, so I'm going to talk about the, the elephant family. Now, a family of elephants is referred to as a herd, and they make a, a group which will be between eight and a hundred elephants in a family unit. The matriarch, which will be the female elephant, usually the grandmother or great-grandmother, she'll be the leader of those elephants. Now, the whole family structure will take the lead from her. She knows from experience where the best water and the best feeding grounds are, and that's where she will lead the, the herd to. Now, in a family herd, you also have young males. And when these males get to about 12, 13 years old, a teenager, they start getting a little bit excited as most of their teenage years. And normally, the females will actually kick those males out. And they have to go and spend a life as a bachelor. And as they're going around as a bachelor, they will meet up with more mature males, and they become as asparagus to those males. And those males will teach them the way of the bush and the, basically the etiquette of the bush as well. Now, if a female comes into estrus, there's normally a mature male that will come and find her. She will leave scent marks or markings for those males to hone in on her. And then uh, once he's pregnated, he'll probably move off. She's pregnant for 22 months, and then a young baby is born. Now, when that baby is born, it's about 50 kgs in weight. So they normally just have one baby. Okay. Now, as a, a baby is growing up, that baby will be loved by all the, the aunts and sisters and cousins and everybody else in the family. And they often hug. An elephant will actually go up and hug and put their trunk around and hug that baby, just giving a little bit of assurance to that baby. Um, Now, elephants also communicate with uh, vibrations, they have sounds, so they will um, talk to each other as they're going through their, their daily activities. Now, this is a video that I took on my last trip out to the Kruger National Park in South Africa. And this is just a family of um, elephants moving around. And there's a youngster over there, he's actually going to start playing with one of his mates, or his brother or sister. He's actually starting to sort of play and bully at the same time. They start to practice the, um, the, the ability to fight for dominancy for a later life or when they get older. <laughs> Trying to sit on them so they, they have a real proper family sort of life. But now when the, the one on the ground gets up, he's actually a little bit taller than the other one. And then the other one will suddenly become a little bit submissive. Now, when they're looking at each other right now, they're actually sizing themselves up, making the ears a lot bigger, so they look bigger and trying to intimidate each other. Then the little guy now is going to run around the other side of that bush in a short while. But in the meantime, the, the females will be watching what's going on or sensing what is actually going on with this family. He moves off and says, I'll get you next time. <laughs> there he is, looking over the top of the bushes. You can still see the ears are standing up. Now he's acting as if nothing ever happened. And the other one will come chase him off. There's the rest of the family. In this particular herd, there was about 15 to 17 elephants here. Now, 
Uh, elephants live up to about 65 years of age. But with elephants, when they're younger, they also try and intimidate each other, as I've mentioned. And on the next slide, we were actually at a water hole, and we crept up onto this young elephant, and he was busy drinking. He saw us in the vehicle. I'm actually filming at the back. These are the clients in the front. And they do get very close to the vehicle. Now, he's looking at us full on. Now, if you look at your hand, and as you bring your hand closer, your hand actually starts to get bigger. So that elephant looks at that vehicle and thinks, well, I'm actually quite big until he gets a bit closer. And then suddenly he realizes that he's actually not that big and he will move off. Now, the fact that we showed no signs of being scared, he thought he better get a little bit nervous and scared, and he slowly moved off. Are you all supposed to go, oh, <laughs> that's it. That's just a little baby elephant coming up to have a look at us in the vehicle knowing that his mom is back, he's got a lot of family support behind him, so he's feeling quite brave. Okay, these are the African wild dogs, also known as the painted wolves. They are very closely related to the wolves in America. The only difference is the wolves in America, when they hunt, they will eat the food and they will scoff it for themselves. Where the wild dogs, if they hunt, they will share the food amongst the family. That is the big difference between the two. So this is a, a pack. Packs can be around about 2 to 14 dogs in a pack. An average pack will be about 15 dogs. And they will hunt as a family and they will share the food amongst the family. Now I was fortunate enough to, to catch this early hours of the morning. It's a little bit faded. I don't know what it looks like behind me. Now, I just missed these dogs. They were actually on the hunt, and they just missed a wildebeest. Now, when the dogs hunt, they will normally choose a particular animal that they are going to go for. And as they're going for that animal, they will tire that animal out so that it cannot run anymore, and then they'll move in for the kill. Now, it sounds very gruesome because they actually eat the animal alive. Now, when I say it sounds gruesome, they actually kill the animal quicker than any other predator in the world. So what happens, that animal is running now. They'll have, let's say, five dogs chasing the animal in a zigzag motion away from, from each other. And then the other dogs will be running down the side, but just jogging to get the energy, keep or store the energy, while the first, say, five dogs are chasing and they start to run out of energy. As they run out of energy, the whole time they are communicating with each other with different calls. And then those dogs that are getting tired will chase that animal, their prey, into the other dogs that are still fresh. And then those dogs were hunted down. And if they get tired, they send it to the other dogs. By that time, that animal that's been hunted can hardly run. It starts to walk. The dog's moving. They give a signal moving. One grabs the tail, and the other one will go for the mouth. Now, when you're out of breath and you try and gasp for breath, and your mouth gets closed off, you can't. You're going to faint just like that. And also, while they bite the, the nose, all the nerve endings are at the, the nose. And this actually tranquilizes that animal so it feels nothing. The other dogs move in and they just rip it to pieces and they eat it. They will kill an impala and eat it within about two and a half to three minutes, completely eaten. That's how quick they are. And then once they've done that, some dogs might not have got enough food. So they will whine to each other and it will help them to regurgitate the food. Sometimes they run underneath the other one's stomach to regurgitate the food and then they eat it again. And then they, oh, that guy, he hasn't got one, and they go to him and he regurgitates and they will feed each other. They've got to keep the family strong. That is the main reason for this. And that's what they do. Okay, we've seen that one there. Eh? Yeah. Okay, Peter's not going on? YouTube? No, no, oh, yes, YouTube, please. This is a YouTube video. If you want to go and have a look at it yourself, just YouTube wild dogs. Super cute. Now, when the dogs have gone out on a hunt and they've got pups at the den, they will run back with the food in their stomach. As they're running back, that food is starting to digest. And when they get back to the den, the, the pups will come out of the den and they'll start to squawk. And this will encourage those dogs to regurgitate the food. And that food is becoming super tender when the video starts to play. 
become super tender, and then the pups will start to eat as well. They've got to keep the, the whole family strong. Now, the pups at about 10 weeks are weaned off the mother, but at about 12 weeks, they will start to hunt with the, the pack. Okay. Can we go oh, full screen? You'll see the dogs are trying to encourage the pups to come out of the, the den. And this is where the female will have her pups. Now the female, you'll have the alpha male and the alpha female. They are the only ones that breed in a pack of dogs. And very often the female will go out and lead the, the hunt as well. Leaving some of the other family members to actually babysit the pups while they're on the hunt. Thank you. They want to drink. There's the other female. Look at it. Let's go out for a suck on that. Watch it. Come on. Now, those older pups, or the, sorry, the older dogs will not bully those pups. They will just be very curious with them. As I say, they're a very strong family, so they don't want to injure each other. Now, sometimes, even if there's one that's been injured for some reason or sick, the other dogs will help to. Uh, nurture that one back to health. There you'll see the dogs are actually regurgitating food now for the pups. We've got some more food added. Yeah. Sorry? That is probably from about here to that wall away. There's the runt of the litter coming out. You see he's not as stable on his feet as the others are. But, but very often because he's the runt, he actually becomes the stronger dog at the end. Because he's got to try and fight off and defend himself. You see, they use all kinds of signals as well. You'll see the tails moving all the time. And even on the hunt, the tails will come up or they'll go down. They've got very large ears. Those ears, they will be able to pick up any animals out in the wild when they go on the hunt, whether it is an impala or whether it is a wildebeest or something bigger. They just can hear the, the sound of the feet when they know what size animal they're going for. If it's a smaller pack of dogs, they'll go for something smaller. If it's a big pack, they need to go for something bigger. Now the dogs, they will hunt at least once a day. If they don't get something in the morning, they will go again at night and do their hunt. Okay, good. Okay, thanks, Peter. You'll see they've got very large ears. Oh, okay, go to the next slide. Now this is also just to help him hear what is out in the bush, and that's what they're going to go for. All right, these are the Mokpoho brothers. They're a very famous um, pack of lions, or um, a coalition of lion males. These six males basically took over the whole Sabi Sands Reserve. They had the largest territory out of all males ever recorded in history. If you go onto YouTube, you'll be able to get more information on these guys. Um, very often, males will form a coalition of two to three males, and they will have a, a pride or maybe even two prides. With these six guys, they had a lot of females underneath them, different prides of females and their territory was in the, the hundreds of uh, square kilometers. Now you can see how well camouflaged lions can be. And I'm actually parked over here, and there's the end of the road over there. Now, a family unit of lions is known as a pride, and you can have between two and 40 lions in a pride of lions. 
Now, this particular pride is in the uh, Timbavati and borders onto the Kruger National Park. And they've just finished eating and had something to drink, and now they're coming down to relax on the road. The road will be nice and warm, so they often lie down there. That also helps to digest their, their, their food. This is a young male that's coming onto the road first. Now, that's the female. Now, lions are very social animals or very social cats. And often when they're walking past each other, they will move their heads together or bump their heads together and they've got to touch each other. Now that line, as I say, would probably be sitting about over there. Now lions, when they go out on the hunt, they also have a little bit of a plan when they go for a hunt. Quite often they will try and ambush the, the prey where they might move around like this and around like that, have some say over here and then they will chase the animal into the ones that are hiding in the bush. Okay, next one. Now this, this is a young male, he's probably about 18 months to two years old. Eventually, give him another few months, he'd actually be kicked out of the herd, actually out of the pride, and he'd have to go and find a few other males to go and form a coalition with. And there's the whole pride there. Okay, I'm just putting the hyena in here. Um, they are a, a scavenger. They're also pretty successful hunters. And they will go out and very often scavenge from leopard, hyena, from cheetah, wild dog, and also from uh, lions. If there's a, a few hyenas together, they'll quite easily steal food from a, a, a single lion or even two lions. This is a female obviously feeding her youngsters. They don't look that young. And there they look pretty cute. Now if I was out in the wild, these are the ones, that one animal that I'll be actually pretty nervous about. Lions, if you walk in the bush, they'll probably run away. Hyenas, they will probably stay there. I was out on a, on a game drive one, one evening and we all got out to have a, a bit of a sundowner and everybody was standing around and suddenly everybody started looking at me and I thought, okay, what are you looking at? And I turned around and there was a hyena standing behind me just over there. He did nothing. So I just turned around, faced him and I walked back slowly and then he moved off. It was in the day. If it was at night, he would probably come and do something. They've been known to take off people's ankles out camping, or take their faces off, or things like that. So they look quite cute, but uh, extremely dangerous. And that is a leopard, one of my favorites. Now leopards, they would have a, a male and female that come together for mating. And then the male goes on his way, the female must raise the, the, the babies. Now when she does the hunting, the male, if he's in the area, will sometimes actually come and steal that food away from the female, even if she has to feed a baby. He doesn't care, he's gonna steal it. So she's gonna make sure that she keeps it away from, from the family, or from the, the male. Now this picture, I was on a game drive. I had somebody sitting right here, and that leopard was right over there. Now they're not gonna jump on a vehicle and attack you because they see the vehicle, they don't see you. Now, if you had to suddenly move, maybe two things could happen. One, they'll run away, which is more likely going to happen. The other one, they'll run away. Okay. Now, we have to have a look at the success rate of the family as a structure and also the success rate of hunting. Which animal do you think is the most successful hunter? Which animal do you think is the least successful hunter? Okay, the lion, when they hunt, they will get about 20% to 25% of their prey. So they're not very successful because they don't communicate with each other. So when they go out, they, they sort of, okay, you go there, you go there, and it's not really a, a planned thing, and they, they, they miss out. Then the hyenas, they will sometimes just go by themselves or a few of them go together, and they are about 35% success. And then a, a leopard, they're about 38% successful. Now, very often a leopard will not run from here to that wall to go after its prey, unless it's really desperate. They will literally jump from here to there onto its prey. So with the camouflage, they can just lie in the bush and creep up very close and then pounce on their, their prey. And then you'll have the cheetah. Because of their speed, 
the, their success rate is about 40 to 50 percent. And they can get, get speeds of about 110 k's an hour, and they can reach that speed in about 2.2 seconds. So it's probably faster than some people's Teslas if they've got a Tesla. Okay. And then the wild dog is the most successful because they communicate as a family and they move out as a family. They know what they're going to go for before they, they do anything. So they will basically look at a herd and they'll be able to pick out the, the weak and then they'll go for that weak um, animal and then hunt them down. Now it sounds all cruel, but at the same time they are actually taking out the weak genes in, in the animal kingdom. So what animal family do you think you are part of? What animal family do you think you'd like to be part of? <laughs> Elephants. <laughs> Vegetarian, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, folks. Okay. I think we could have all sat and listened for another half an hour. I don't know. Well, come on. <laughs> Want me to carry on? <laughs> I guess seriously, is there any questions? Now, Tracy tells me I have to have a limit on it, you see. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, the most, the, their success rate is about 75% to 80%. Yeah. Now, I picked up a little statistic. One of the most, um, let's say, predator is actually a, um, this is quite out of my mind now, dragonfly. About 95% they go for dragon. Dragonfly will get its prey. Yeah. Any other questions, folks? I'll open just for two minutes. No? Okay. Thanks so much. I think it, it, it's so interesting about the, the whole idea of communication. If anyone's ever lost their elderly father at a supermarket, you know, I'll be waiting outside there. And then you keep, where is he? Where's dad? Oh, I'm at the car, I told you. John and I had quite an interesting uh, altercation where I was, um, he was dropping me off outside Woolies at the forum and he kind of called out what I, I heard, get some eggs as he drove off to go and park. So I ran up with eggs and it was around Easter. So I bought a dozen chicken eggs and I bought a dozen Cadbury hollow eggs because you can never have too many of those, or can you? And I'm standing outside the Woolies entrance with these two things, watching to see when he's gonna, because you know, he was just doing a lap and then coming back, waiting, waiting, waiting. John had said, I'll meet you at Dick Smith's. <laughs> Did not need eggs at all. <laughs> So I think we would have been quite a, quite a svelte-looking uh, dog family because <laughs> our communication was a little lacking at the time. Um, but thank you so much, Clinton. That's amazing. And I'm sure Clinton's happy to, if people would like to come up and ask any questions just while we're having a cup of tea at the end of the service. Uh, we're going to finish off with a song, uh, King of Kings. And it's just so many of these songs this morning have been such an encouragement in the story of Jesus and how Jesus brought us into his family and, and we are um, brothers and sisters, we are children of, of him. So let's sing this together as part of God's family. Um, it's called King of Kings. Let's stand together. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the
benediction that feels very close to my family because I think I heard uh, the Reverend Nick Sturstrat in Albany uh, say it every Sunday for most of my childhood. Um, the first word of it has completely gone from my head right at this moment. Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heavens and the earth, who keeps faith forever and who does not forsake the works of his hands. My brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and, and the Lord Jesus Christ in and through the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. Amen. 